delighted to be here and, um, and talk about some of our work. Um, can everyone hear me okay? All right. So uh, just some of my disclosures, the, uh, the most significant ones being that I'm going to talk about some IP here that, um, uh, that Chet alluded to, which is the, uh, um, e -car the IP is all owned by the University of Chicago, which is where it was developed by my research team. But I have a company that has exclusive licensing rights to that IP. Um, all right, so here are the objectives I want to cover today. So we're going to talk about sepsis screening, in particular pros and cons of different approaches to screening and sepsis, uh, early warning scoring, so the different approaches to doing that, and then in general we're going to learn about how big data and real-time analytics are transforming sepsis and uh, rapid response landscape right now. All right, so I know you guys do a ton of work here in sepsis, and in fact the, the, the work you guys have done is, is truly groundbreaking and um, the your ability to actually bring down sepsis mortality is one of the it, it's, it's one of the cornerstones right now in, in the work that people have done and so you guys are probably well familiar with the definition of sepsis but right the idea that it's life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by dysregulated host response to infection that's the new definition that came out that was the third international consensus for sepsis and septic shock so the sep3 definition of sepsis and what you probably also know this, right, that sepsis is the most expensive condition that we treat in the U.S. It's why everybody cares so much about it. Um, so 1.5 million cases of sepsis in the U.S. each year. Mortality is somewhere between 15 and 30 percent, and I understand you guys now have your, seps your severe sepsis mortality rates significantly below that, so massive kudos to you guys. Um, annual cost of sepsis in the U.S., $24 billion. So that was the bad news. The good news on sepsis is, as you know, it's, uh, the outcomes are largely modifiable. It's why, again, it's the other reason why people care. So one, it's hugely expensive, but two, we can, it's one of the few things that we can make a difference in. And so you guys know you've had tons of success with the, with the bundle, and of the, of the bundle components, the, probably the one that has the best data for it is timely antibiotics. Um, and so, here, so here's some data just from earlier this year in the New England Journal showing that, um, that outcomes in sepsis, so sepsis mortality is hugely tied to the time in which you deliver that antibiotic. So every hour that you delay getting that antibiotic in, your mortality <coughs> increases, and that's a big data set. Um, and we see it again. If you look at, again, prior data, so data from uh, 2006, another study from 2017, all consistent, delaying antibiotics increases mortality. So that's great, that means there are things that we can do and we know the, um, and, and we bundle it with the fluid and the lactate, and everything else, but like I said, antibiotics is the one we, I, I the most confidently stand behind that that one really, we know that one really matters. Um, and so that's great, uh, except that it's not like antibiotics are without their downside too, right? Because when, so we could solve the problem by just putting everybody on antibiotics, right? Everybody gets timely antibiotics. If the second you hit the door, we just give you zosin and vancomycin. And so why don't we just do that? Um, and the answer is because of antibiotic resistance. So when we give antibiotics to, uh, in, when we give antibiotics to too many people, we run the risk of developing antibiotic resistance. And so we're trying to, we're trying to, um, deal with both of those two problematic issues at exactly the same time. And so I think that the general approach that the Surviving Sepsis Campaign has come to, which is um, for, for admitted patients, screen every patient, every shift, every day. Um, and, and that's generally been the approach. And I will say it's not, I totally understand how you get to that approach, and I think that works in, um, Historically, in the way that that we that nursing workflow um, goes down, it actually it makes sense. It fits really cleanly with the way clinicians operate. There are things we pass meds at this time. We'll screen for sepsis at this time, and it's really driven by the providers. Unfortunately, it's not really driven by the patients and the patients' needs because the patients could develop sepsis at any point during that shift. Um, 
And so I, I, I take a slightly different approach to thinking about sepsis. And to me, I think of sepsis as really the intersection between being critically ill and being infected, right? You can be infected and you're not critically ill, and OK, we'll give you some topical antibiotic or a little bit of Keflex, call it a day. Not a big deal, right? A little, a little cellulitis that we don't even admit for. And then there's, you can be critically ill but not be septic, right? You can be in shock that has nothing to do with infection. But sepsis is when those two things inter intersect. And so we really need to find both of those things. And I think for me, the, the approach that the Surviving Sepsis Campaign takes is screen everybody for infection, then see if they're critically ill. I actually think you probably want to go about it the other way, which is, Think about who's sick first, and then if you're sick, think about who's infected. And I'll, and I'll make the case for why I think we should do that. Okay, um, so but let me start a little bit with how do we go about, so if we follow the surviving sepsis campaigns, let's think about a little bit how we decide who's infected in the first place. Um, so this was a paper that we published, uh, I think it was last year, um, our, so de detecting sepsis are two opinions better than one. And here's what we did, we essentially, did we screened, um, the, the nurses did their screen every shift, and then, the, and then we, we looked at whether the physicians ordered cultures or antibiotics um, to see whether they suspected infection. So, um, so here's the thing, um, often they didn't agree, so we, had, we looked at everybody who had a, a positive SIRS screen during the time that we were running this. So we had, there were 11,489 total screens, and of those, about a third of them were positive uh, for met SIRS criteria. So there in and of itself is a, a problem, I'll come back to that one in a minute, but a third of all the sepsis screens that got done on this med surge unit met SIRS criteria. But of those, the nurses suspected infection in about 23%, uh, um, and, and then the physicians in about, uh, this, is, if, this is, you have to add these two together, so six and, uh, seven, so 13%, but like they only overlapped in about 6% of the patients did both the nurses and the physicians agree that they suspected infection. And so, um, so w what's interesting is so a third of the patients meet SIRS criteria, a third of the patients for whom SIRS is positive, at least somebody thinks they might be infected. Um, but if, um, but for those patients who progressed to septic shock and, de and death, that was two to three times more likely if both the RN and the MD or APP suspected infection. So here's, here's the other, so who do you think is better? Nurses or physicians in terms of suspecting? So we tell you, their nurses suspect it more often. So who do you think is more accurate in suspecting it? Or who does it first? The nurses, they, the nurses are hours ahead. So if you look at 48 hours, so, so if you look at just those patients who transferred to the ICU, so the ones who su were suspected of infection and ultimately went to the ICU, uh, supposedly in septic shock, and you look at the time in which they suspected it, so here's the, the MD slash APP line is here. So 48 hours below about 7% of the patients were suspected as having infection. And these are all, these are patients who went to the ICU with severe sepsis or septic shock. So so 48 hours, 7%, uh, about uh, the nurses are about twice as many of, uh, a, the percentage is twice as high for nurses. And it's essentially scales the whole entire time, where whatever hour we're at, the nurses, there's a larger proportion of those patients that are suspected of being infected. Um, so the nurses have some sense, but the physicians are slow at ordering cultures or antibiotics in those patients, and they're a few hours behind. But look what happens the second they move to the ICU, boom, the physicians catch up, and now they're in the same line. So the nurses know it, but they're not communicating it, or they're communicating it, and the physicians and APPs aren't buying it, uh, and I'm not sure. Um, so, so here's the other, um, he, here's the, 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 other, the, the, in, the other interesting news on this. If you look at how SIRS criteria tracks with, um, with clinicians, you'll see that here's, so these again, these were the patients in the, the time that they went to the ICU. 
um, if you look at, uh, at SERS compliance, they're meeting, so 48 hours before they're at, the, you know, 30% of those patients were meeting SERS criteria. But the antibiotics and cultures, that's when the physicians and APPs track almost exactly with SERS. So when the patients meet SERS criteria, that's when the physicians and APPs decide to check cultures and do antibiotics. But the nurses were ahead of SERS. Um, so, so search criteria, again, you guys are probably very familiar with them because you're using it, but the, the idea is you need two out of the following four criteria in order to meet search criteria. So your heart rate has to be above 90, your temp has to be greater than 38 or less than 36, you've got to be breathing at a rate of greater than 20, and you have to have a white, white count and or have a white count greater than 12 or less than 4. So if you meet two of these criteria, you're said to be SERS positive. Right. But the problem with SERS criteria is, like I said, a third, I showed you a third met SERS criteria. Those were, those were the, of all the screens. The problem with SERS criteria is that everybody will meet SERS criteria if, at some point. If you haven't met SERS criteria, you just haven't been in the hospital long enough. Right? Everybody who gets up to go to the bathroom then strains to have a bowel movement is meeting SERS criteria, right? Your heart rate goes up a little bit, your respiratory rate goes up. Like, I'm probably meeting SERS criteria right now. <laughs> um, and so, here, so here's, actually, if you, this was a, a study we published in the Blue Journal in 2015. So if you look at all ward patients, and this was a multi-center study, uh, with you know, 270,000 patients in it. If you look on admission, 15% of patients admitted to the med surge unit are meeting surge criteria on admission, on their first vital sign set in, when they hit the ward. By 48 hours, 50% of the patients have met surge criteria at least once. By the time they're there a week, 85% of the patients have met surge criteria. So like I said, you will meet surge criteria, it's just a question of when and if someone documents it when you do. So, um, so that's when it, some folks started to say, well, let's see if we can do a better job, right? Search, so anybody know how people came up with search criteria? A, a bunch of really good clinicians sat around a table and said, what criteria should we put, you know, what criteria should make us think about infection? And they're really good clinicians. And at the time, that was exactly the right way to do it, because that's how we did things with expert consensus. And so now we're in a better position in terms of other things that we can add. So now we have data, and so now we can um, now now we can add data and the, and the value of that. And so a bunch of researchers got together, grabbed a massive data set, and said, okay, well, if we wanted to develop a, essentially a surge criteria, but from data, what would that look like? And so from the data, they come up with three criteria, and you need to meet two of these. So systolic blood pressure less than 100, uh, any altered mental status, and a respiratory rate greater than 22. Uh, and, that's, and so it's interesting, right, because this, it, in a lot of ways it's better because it's data driven. And so you see the cut points, they, they didn't decide the cut points, the cut points were determined by the data. Um, and that's more consistent with other data that we see. Um, and, and, and they're way more specific than SIRS. So if you're meeting SIRS, uh, if you're meeting QSOFA criteria, you're much more likely to have a bad outcome and be infected, right, than, than if you're meeting SIRS criteria. The problem is, and is do you really need a score to tell you that if you're altered and tachypneic, you should be worried about a patient? Like that's what, that's essentially what this is. The, the beauty of it is super simple. It's a scale, anybody can do this at, at the bedside and that's great. And I think SIRS was developed in the same way to be able to do it at the bedside simply. Um, and I will say, n no. I, I, we no longer live in a world where we're required to do these things at the bedside and so we don't actually need to keep them this simple. We can make them a lot more complicated because we don't have to worry our pretty little heads off about it. We've invested in all of our computing resources and they can do this work for us. And that means we can have much more complicated tools with way more data inputs in them. So this was a study, a prospective validation of QSOFA um, from 30 EDs in, across Europe, 879 patients, 
suspected infection over a four-week period. High scores in the, in the ED were used to predict 30-day mortality. And here's what you see, exactly what I, what I told you. If you look at QSOFA versus SIRS, SIRS is way more sensitive, so 93% sensitive versus QSOFA sensitivity of 70%. Um, but QSOFA is way more specific, 79% versus 27%. And therein is going to lie your trade-off for any tool that you use. You're always going to be trading off sensitivity versus specificity, and so you're so, um, and and that's it's always a trade-off. Do you want to pick up more patients? Sure, but you're going to end up with a lot more false alarms. Uh, and if you do, you want to limit false alarms and not have the, the alarm going off? Sure, but you're going to miss some patients that you would have otherwise trade. <coughs> and so, um, and so that's an inherent trade-off, and we have to figure out. And so. I'll say that the other approach to this is to not start with who's infected, but rather to start with who's sick first. And let me tell you a little bit about how the, the approach to thinking about who's sick, which actually follows the way <coughs> SIRS and QSOFA went down. So um, I know you guys have the ability to do MUSE here. I heard about it last night. How many folks are look at it regularly on patients I want to see? Muse on your patients. So Muse is the Muse is probably the the best, most used of the early warning scores, and it comes out of the UK, um, and and it's pretty good. Just like SIRS, it's pretty good. Um, if you add up, you can add up your score. So depending on what your respiratory rate is, you get a point. If your respiratory rate is 18, um, and if your heart rate is 105, we're at two points so far. And if your systolic blood pressure is 75, we'll get another two points. We're at four points. Uh, if your if your temp is 40, we'll get another two points for that. So we're at six. And then um, and then the patient has normal mental status. So there you go. Muse of six. You can do this again in your at the bedside. And it was developed in the UK in the 90s in a time of paper-based charting without any data behind it. Same thing. Their best clinicians sat around a table and said, what criteria should we put into the Muse and how should we score them and how do we do it so that it's really nice and neat and everybody can do it without a, without a calculator. Um, and then more recently, the UK has switched to their national early warning scores. So what they did was take a massive data set and say, okay, if we were going to improve on the Muse using data, what would that look like? And so here's what happens when you take the Muse and datafy it. Um, and you see they add a couple more uh, variables to it. So now they have seven variables in it. They kept the three-point scale because they still wanted people to be able to do it at the bedside. But now you can see it's data-driven because here are, a couple, here, are, here are a couple clues that this is moved by data. So one, respiratory rates. Now you don't get a point if your respiratory rate is 20. Because before if you looked at the Muse, you actually already got a point. And they were, so they were right in that a respiratory rate of 20 is actually elevated but not in the hospital. So, so let me ask you guys, I figure hospitals are one of three things. You're either a 16 hospital, an 18 hospital, or a 20 hospital. I come from a 20 hospital. What are you guys? 18, yeah. I don't know if it's a southern thing, but, but. Are you all 18 on every unit, or are the, sur like, do you have 16s on the surgery floors? Because sometimes the units are a little different, but yeah, but they're all one of those three things, uh, with 18 actually being the most popular. So, um, so if you actually look at the data, 20 would be considered normal in the hospital, 8, 16, 18, 20, and so you really shouldn't give a point until you get over that. But then you, but respiratory rate turns out to be really important, and so it gets weighted more heavily. Um, Temperature turns out to not be weighted that heavily. Notice you can't get to, to three points unless you're hypothermic, because it turns out hypothermia is actually worse than hyperthermia in terms of predicting adverse events. So these are, this is all consistent with data that we've seen, and also if you're, if you're altered, that's really bad. Not a little bit bad, it's really bad. And so again, all, this is what happens when you take data, and not surprisingly, it's better. The news is better than, um, than news. Um, so, so we did a study looking at what happens if you, if you look at all of these, you know, do, do you need to use a sepsis specific tool and also an early warning score, or can you start with an early warning score? And so 
we compared both in the ward in the I and in the uh, ER the, the SIRS, QSOFA, MUSE, or NEWS. And so I'm going to talk a lot about AUCs, so let me just take a second to just orient everybody to what a, an area under the curve is. So, so we talked about sensitivity and specificity both move, but if you want to get an overall um, measure of how good a tool is, AUC is the better one to do it. So it's the area under the receiver operating curve. And what that means essentially is that if I were to pick two patients at random from the population, one who was septic and one who wasn't, if I had an AUC of 90%, 90% of the time, my the patient who was septic would have had a higher um, a higher score than the one who wasn't. So, um, so but basically, it's a it's a percent accuracy with 50%, an, an AUC of 0.5 being a perfect coin flip, um, and uh, an AUC of one being a perfect predictor. And you'll never never see a perfect predictor. So we're looking to get up to, you know, it, what, we're, we're aiming to get up over, at least over 70s, and we want to get up to over 90s if possible. That's the, that's the range we're talking about. Um, so if you look at SIRS, for example, the area under the curve for predicting uh, adverse events in patients who are infected. So this is patients who ultimately, these are patients who ultimately received cultures and antibiotics. Um, this SIRS has an AUC of less than 0.6 in both the ward and the ED. QSOFA is better, right, in both, in both environments. Uh, MUSE is better than that, and you notice quite a big jump when you go from QSOFA to MUSE, and NEWS is even better than that. So we take from this, the early morning, the early morning tools are better than your sepsis-specific tools for identifying these patients. Um, and so then the question is, well, can you, we do even better than news? Here's, here's just a, a timeline just so you can see this is the time in which um, patients transferred to the ICU if we look just at that patient population. So, so again, uh, the patients were surge greater than two, 90% um, of those patients met surge criteria at the by the time they went to the ICU. Uh, QSOFA greater than two, it was only 55% or so of the patients were meeting Q, had met QSOFA criteria before they went to the ICU. There's your, there's your sensitivity issue. Um, and QSOFA greater than or equal to seven falls somewhere in between. And you can see the timing and when those, and they track pretty well. But again, that's your trade-off in sensitivity. Um, at, if you look at the 50% the point, so the point in which 50% of those patients had met those criteria, uh, QSOFA criteria are met six hours before, we get uh, NEWS greater than seven is met 12 hours before, and SIRS greater than uh, two is met about 18 hours before. So the timing, so it's both sensitivity and the timing that are impacted. Okay, so here's why I think NEWS does better than QSOFA. It essentially includes the QSOFA criteria in it, right? Those are the three QSOFA criteria. Uh, respiratory rate greater than 22, a um, blood pressure less than 100, and any altered mental status. Already included right in NEWS plus all this other stuff. So not surprising then that it would be better. It's basically QSOFA on steroids. And so now I'll say, and all of that is awesome and great if you live in a paper-based world. So if you have to do math at the bedside, and you don't have an electronic health record, and you don't have a calculator, then you absolutely should be using a tool that you can do in your head. But we don't live in that world anymore now. And you, I know you guys don't, and we certainly don't. We've spent a billion dollars at this point, and in it's certainly hundreds of millions on our on our EHR, and it's probably over a billion at this point. How much have you guys spent on your on your computers and your EHR? A lot, right? And what are you using it for? You're you're using it to store. I would say like the EHR is a place where data goes to die, right? You're using it as a big storage warehouse where a lot of stuff sits in it. But it actually can work for us if we pull out our data and actually make it do cool things. So my group at the university has spent the last decade trying to figure out if, if we could use all the data at our disposal, 
um, what and wanted to build a, a muse that was truly data driven and wasn't confined to being able to calculate it in your head, what would that look like? Um, so we borrowed from you know big business because that's what's going on today. And we thought about Netflix did something that I thought was fascinating a few years ago. They put out a million dollar challenge. These, it, this, their predictive analytics, in fact, all of these big companies like Amazon, Google, Netflix, everybody, their, their business is big data and big data analytics. Um, they, they, they have algorithms that say based on the movies, your, the, the movies that you've already rented, what are you likely to like <coughs> next, right? And that's really important to them because that's actually how they keep you on their, on their site because if you just keep watching the next movie and you like their recommendations, you're likely to stick with them. So they, um, they put out a million dollar challenge to, uh, to, to cr and crowdsource their data. They said, here's, all, here's the data of all these people. Turns out, actually, it was kind of problematic because um, it was supposed to be de-identified data, but it turns out you're actually really talented uh, programmers were able to actually re-identify some of that data based on and figure out who had rented all those uh, movies which isn't ideal, but let's pretend like you really truly could de-identify the data and put it out into the world, which they did. And then they said, okay, we'll give you a million dollars to the group that improves our algorithm by the most. You have to improve it by at least 10%, um, and the one that does it the best will get a million dollars. Um, and so a bunch of different uh, computer scientists went at this challenge, and it turns out that they um, that the winning algorithm was a, a machine learning algorithm called a random forest model. And I won't bore you with the specifics unless you unless you really want to. I'm happy to delve into the details of what a random forest model is. But it's um, it's sort of a fancy regression tree model. And um, and that was the winner. And those guys uh, made a million dollars because they made the Netflix algorithm better. And I'll tell you that. All these machine learning algorithms that have now come out, such as the random forest, the gradient boosted machine, I'll show you a bunch of them in a second. None of those existed 10 years ago. This is all, these are new, the field of statistics has had to grow with the data because we never had data in the way that we have it now. It's so massive, you need completely different tools to be able to look at it. So I didn't have a million dollars. But I did have, I have coffee and I know how to do kudos. So I put out that challenge in my research group and I said, let's do this. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna do our own little Netflix challenge and we're gonna see who can improve on the Muse the best. Here's the data set. And uh, we have a data set of 270,000 patients. Who do it however you want. We're gonna do a bunch of different uh, algorithms. You can't use any other variables other than the ones in this data set. Let's see which one wins. Anyone want to guess at which one won? It was the random forest. The random forest, same as the one that won the Netflix, beats out all of the other tools. So, here, so here's the Muse, AUC, and this is now for predicting cardiac arrest, ICU transfer, or death. So the, the, the combined outcome in, um, within the next 24 hours. So calculate a score and then look to see what happens in the next 24 hours. <coughs> AUC from you is 0.7. All the machine learning models are better. So linear regression, that's sort of how historically health services researchers have done predictive analytics. So that's sort of basic before you get into machine learning. The spline regression is a, is a, a fancier version of these. And, and all of these are now machine learning analytics. And the random force is very similar to the gradient boosted machine, which I'll talk a little bit about. Uh, essentially, both of these work really, really well, but the gradient boosted machine turns out at, uh, is smaller and easier to export and hand off to someone else if they want to reproduce it. Um, so, he, so here's the basic, the, the, what that means. So you say, so, cause you're looking at this and you're like, okay, so who cares? What's the difference between an AUC of 0.7 and 0.8? What does that mean for me at the bedside? Right, anybody care right now about AUC 0.7 versus 0.8? Cause Muse is free and you can do it right now in your EHR, like who cares? Why would we do it even, you know, we're done. We can just stop. Um, here's why you care. So in that data set of 270,000, the difference at the same level of sensitivity. So the same ability to predict 50,000 fewer false alarms with the um, machine learning analytic over the Muse. That's a lot. That's this many people sitting in the stadium, right? 
50,000 is a ton. And that's, um, that's, uh, and this is, uh, um, this is a uh, Wrigley Field, by the way. Oh, is it you? Or mortgage, whatever, it's Soxfield. Oh, you're right, it's Soxfield. Thank you, my bad. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, uh, so so, so 50,000, huge, it's a huge impact, because what does that mean? What do false alarms mean to your clinicians? Right, false alarm means this doesn't work. This is really annoying. And they start to not believe in the system, one. Number two, they're wasting a lot of resources responding to that that they could be using on other things. All right, so here are other things, though, that we can do from the random forest, which I really like. If we can see this, we can figure out now what are the strongest predictors of deterioration. So if we, from, from the 33 variables that went into the model, it turns out, hands down, the strongest predictor is respiratory rate, followed by heart rate, and then age. Notice age is, hasn't been in any of the other tools we talked about. It wasn't in Muse, it wasn't in News, it wasn't in SIRS, it wasn't in QSOFA, but it's the third most predictive. It's actually intentionally not in the News, because the News folks, they did it with data. Why didn't they include age in their model? Because they knew that age was predictive, they had it. And the answer is because it was the UK and it was a political decision to intentionally leave news out, uh, to intentionally leave age out because they were afraid that otherwise they would predispose to taking care of older patients. Which is, it, it's like, I'm not sure it's the wrong approach, except it's not what the data would tell you. The data would tell you that age is really important and I'll tell you actually, it inter, and, and there, it's really, it, the way it interplays with the other variables is important. So from a, from a true data science standpoint, I think it's actually really wrong to leave age out. I'll argue that I actually think um, ethically it's wrong to leave it out too, but, um, but that's how that happened. Uh, so all the vital signs and um, rise to the top, blood pressure, temperature, this was interesting to me because I didn't know this. BUN, of all the labs that we do routinely on patients every day, BUN is the single most predictive. They said, you guys know that? I should have known it, I guess, because like there's data going back for decades on pancreatitis, that BUN was so important in pancreatitis, and I guess those are really, really sick patients. Um, but interesting, it wasn't obvious to me. Um, and that's more important than white count, glucose, Oxygen saturation, look how oxygen saturation is, you know, falls below some of those labs. And then platelets, below that. Like hemoglobin doesn't even make the top 10 list. And this is just the top 10, I didn't include all the rest of them. But here's, so, but here's how they interplay, and this is all stuff that we can see now with the big data. But okay, here's age against risk. So here's, here's the probability of having an adverse event, and here's age. Who's upset about this right now? Because <laughs> I know how old you are if you say yes to this one. I'm upset. I'm, I will own. I'm on the other side of 40. Whoever told you 40 is the new 20 is lying. Like, that's just not true. That risk starts to go up big time once you get over 40. I guess the only good news is that it's pretty flat for a long time until you get up over, you know, 70. So, uh, so 50 is much worse than 40 and 60 is much worse than 50. Um, but, uh, and then it flattens out once you're over 75. So uh, I don't know if that's good news or bad news at that point. But, but this is real data, like I didn't make this up. This is the data telling me this story. So I didn't know, that's, that's how that looks. Okay, but to completely different curve if you look at respiratory rate, for example. Right, respiratory rate is bimodal. It's bad on both ends. I told you already that if you're in the 16 to 20 range, that's normal because essentially that means we didn't measure and we don't care. Right? We're not worried about the patient, so we're writing 16, 18, or 20. Um, but it's bad if you get low, and it's really bad if you get high. Right? If, um, but now we can do things and we can look at the, um, at the relationship between those two variables. So now here, this is a, 30, a 3D graph showing respiratory rate, age, and risk all interacting with each other. And so I'm gonna walk you through this because I know you're like, yeah, that's pretty, but I don't get it. So hold on one second, I'm gonna show you. So here's, here's how you read this. As your respiratory rate goes up, your risk goes up. And it doesn't matter how old you are. If you're breathing at a rate of 40, you are toast, and I don't care if you're 20 or if you're 60. That's really bad. If, on the other hand, you're breathing at 10, it's really only bad if you're old. 
Andrew, right? Again, this is the data. I didn't make this up, but this is what happens when you actually let the data tell you a story. And these models, when we build a machine learning model, it takes into account all of these things and the interactions between these variables. All right. So here's another way that we went at it. We looked at um, how do you, back to how do you define infection? We, we put in another thing. This one just came out this month. Um, I don't know if anyone saw this one in critical care medicine. But we said, how do we even define, if we have big data, how do we define suspicion of infection? So is it anybody who got a culture? Is it, did you have to have a blood culture? Does it, did you have to have a culture and antibiotic before, someone, before you're confident someone suspected infection? Did you have to have a blood culture and antibiotic? Did you have to have at least four days of antibiotics? Or um, did you have to have a blood, you probably the, the strictest is, if someone had a blood culture and they got at least four days of antibiotics, can we all feel fairly confident that somebody suspected infection in that patient? So you can go you know, from the lightest, so anybody, so somebody ordered a urine culture on a patient, did they suspect infection? Probably, maybe. Um, did the, you know, but, but if you got a blood culture and four days of antibiotics, you def somebody definitely suspected. So we looked at, does it matter how we define suspicion of infection in terms of the different scores and the approaches? And so here's a, like a big souped up version of the graph that I showed you before, um, looking at SOFA, SIRS, QSOFA, MUSE, news and now eCart, which is what we call our, um, our machine learning analytic. If, depending on how you, define, uh, how you define suspicion of infection, and the answer is no matter how you define it, eCart is gonna predict better than news, which is gonna predict better than Muse, which is gonna predict better than QSOFA, which is better than SIRS, which is comparable to SOFA. Um, again, and it doesn't matter. Uh, interestingly, if you look at news, news does better. The more confident you are about suspicion of infection, the better news gets. Uh, news is not that different from muse in the, in the, the any culture population, interestingly. But, um, but QSOFA doesn't care, and muse actually doesn't care. There, you can see it truly doesn't matter. All right, so, so how do we do that? I, so I told you we built all this stuff so that you, so, so we could do it in real time in, the, in a new computer age world, but now I actually have to show you how do we actually do that. And so the, the answer is here's how we do it. Um, we, we built eCart so that we can pull data from the EHR, we can pull our lab data directly from SunQuest, we get our ADT feed directly, it comes in an HL7 feed. As soon as a new piece of data comes in, the computer calculates a new eCart score, and then we use that score to drop patients into different categories, high risk, moderate risk, average risk. We actually now even use a low risk category, and that's a patient population we, would, uh, we can leave alone. I'll show you that. But here's how, before we actually turned it on in the hospital, we ran it in the background, just silently on three different units to see what would happen. And during that time, we had 10 patients who had a cardiac arrest on one of those three units. This is, these are med surge, they were two oncology, two med surge and one oncology unit. Um, 10 patients arrested on the unit. The team called rapid response on one of those patients. So they were worried about one of those 10 patients and called for help. ECART would have triggered, 80% of the patients would have uh, triggered at the red threshold. If you add the moderate risk threshold, every single patient would have been flagged at some point before that patient arrested. ICU transfers are, um, uh, they do a better job so of calling rapid response for ICU transfers. They get about a third of those. ECART at the moderate or the high risk threshold would have, would have triggered in twice as many. And so the next question though has to be, Great, so you trigger, but when did you trigger? So when would you want to know? What's the, when would it be helpful to know? Would it be helpful for it to trigger five minutes before? Hour before, would you guys be psyched, like to get an alert an hour before a patient arrested? When you can intervene. When can you intervene? That would be when you'd want to know, right? So would an hour, would an hour be enough to make a difference? We have to study that. <laughs> so, so, so I think the sepsis literature would argue that six hours is enough to make a difference, right? 
we've seen, you know, getting in your treatment within six hours. I think there's good data to that. I don't know. Some people would say, you know, as soon or as early as possible. Other people would say, how about 31 hours before? Because that's what that's when we're alerting. And I'll tell you that that's the median time before. Uh, so it was actually 33 hours, but it was 31 hours before RRT. Because it turns out that the median time before they call RRT, 1.7 hours before. So I don't know how you guys do it in your hospital. I'm sure you're way better than ours. But for us, it takes us about 1.7 hours. At the moment where we call rapid response, before the patient is physically in the ICU, that is actually about 1.7 hours for us. That's about how long it takes for us. I'm sure you guys are more efficient. But for rapid response shows up, and then they want to do their own assessment, and then they have to convince the team that they're going to transfer the patient to the ICU. Then they have to wait for the MICU team to show up and agree that they're going to accept the patient. Then they call, then they have to call to give report, right? Nurse has to call to give a report, but the nurse is invariably on break, right? So nurse can't take, does that happen here too? Do people go on break? They're always on break when you're trying to call, when someone's trying to call a report. You cannot take the patient, right? Okay, then finally you get someone to take a report, then you have to wait for transport to come, then you physically move the patient, right? That's about 1.7 hours. So essentially what they're doing is they're calling rapid response when they know they need to go to the ICU, essentially to help facilitate that transfer to the ICU. They're not calling rapid response to get there early and to intervene. On the other hand, 31 hours before actually posed quite a bit of a problem. It's actually too, it's, it's, as far as the rapid response team goes, it's actually too early. They don't want to know 31 hours before. Turns out they want to know eight hours before. I didn't know this, and I'm not sure that the data necessarily would support it all though. Um, but, but from their standpoint, they, they, when it's eight hours before, that's the, that's the e-card score for them where they're like, I can do something. Rapid response doesn't want to show up and do like general care. They want to intervene. They, you know, they want to push the Lasix. They want to order the the positive pressure ventilation. They want to do something, um, and that turns to happen in the eight hours before. Um, so here's some um, here's some examples of patients. So these are real patients from real hospitals. That, uh, and if you look at their retrospective data, grab it and then calculate e card scores on them. These were all patients who had a cardiac arrest. So I don't know, did I? Have, no, I think I just put one of them in here. So here's a patient who arrested at time, time zero is when the patient arrested. Here's where they were uh, 14 hours before the arrest is the first time the patient turned red on e card. And you can see these were the variables that were driving the score at that point. Right? It was primarily driven by the, the fact that the patient was tachypnic to 32. This is a 79-year-old guy, bad CAD, terrible COPD. The, I mean, at baseline, this patient is sick. I don't, you know, you guys probably have a bunch of these patients sitting on your med surgery, you know, right? They, they're sick patients. Um, and he's hanging out, and his albumin's probably normally 2.7, and his bicarb is probably always in the high 30s, and his chloride's in the toilet, and his hemoglobin's always, you know, bad. And his sodium's probably a little bit lower than, worse than normal, and his white count's a little bit uh, higher than normal. But it's such a train wreck that it's really easy to, if you're just looking in this, if you ignore the rest of this graph and just look at the variables because that's exactly what the clinicians get. You can look at it and be like, eh, he's baseline. And essentially that's actually what happened. This, the nurse, we show this, the nurse said they called the doc around this time and it was a covering hospitalist and the hospitalist looked at it and said, seems like this patient's a baseline, left the patient on the floor and this patient went on to have an arrest. And if you actually look at this data now, if you look at it zoomed back with, you know, 2020 hindsight, it's really clear this patient wasn't at baseline. But if you're in the myopic view of just looking at your vital signs and labs at this point in time, it's really easy to miss that. And it's not because this, it was a bad clinician. This was a really good clinician, and we're all really good clinicians. It's because we're human beings, and human beings weren't meant to do this. Human beings were meant to look at a bunch of things and normalize it. That's what we do. And I said this I, last night in a group at, at dinner, I think, I said, we have, when someone is tachypnic or tachycardic, we have a thousand reasons why that's fine, right? They're anxious. They're in pain, right? What else? Like, they have a fever. Tons of reasons why what we're seeing is fine. 
But when you actually look at it, the computer doesn't fall victim to those kinds of biases, and so, um, and so we don't run into that problem. Now, I will tell you the other thing that's interesting in, in this whole space is that um, the, the, the nurses said in, um, in, in this case, it is, we've seen, actually, I'll say it wasn't this case, there was another patient where we debriefed. We've debriefed every single cardiac arrest that's happened on the floor in our hospital in the last two years, and we had one of these sorts of cases that came up. Then the nurse called the, the physician and said, the blood pressure is a little bit low, patient's scheduled for Lasix, should I give the Lasix? Doc said, yeah, go ahead, give the Lasix. What the nurse really meant is, I'm nervous about this patient. Can you come see this patient? Um, and, and so what the, I thought that was actually a fascinating exchange because it reminded me of, I, I think we run into this problem a lot. And I will tell you that as, we, as I do this multidisciplinary debriefing, I become even more convinced that nurses and doctors speak two different languages. The next, the, the book that I actually want to write is Nurses Are From Mars, Doctors Are From Venus. <laughs> I'm not kidding, like we speak completely different languages. Nurses speak much more qualitatively, doctors speak much more quantitatively, and we lose signal in the message to each other. And it actually, I think it's a lot like marriage. I said the other thing, who's married? Mm. Married, married, okay. So, <laughs> when I'm not doing medical stuff, I'm reading pop psychology. Now you probably know more about me than you need to. But um, so one of my uh, one of my favorite uh, psycho psych psychologists is John Gottman. Anybody know heard of John Gottman's work? John Gottman runs what he calls a love lab, and he has for thirty. It's real science. Like put has a, um, a lab in Seattle and he takes newlyweds and he puts them in that lab and he videotapes them for 24 hours and then he analyzes the data on from those and he's used it to predict which marriages will succeed and which ones will fail. It's crazy and he can do it with an AUC in the oh, like over 0.9. Predict from a 24-hour observation of a couple in a lab love. So it turns out, so you, you think like how badly people fight would be the most predictive, like the, the couples who fight really nasty, you think that would be really predictive of divorce. It turns out that is not the most predictive thing of, for divorce. It's actually not predictive of divorce at all. You can fight nasty all you want. The actually, the most predictive variable is, is actually whether you turn towards each other, it's, it's the percent of bids for connection that are responded to. And so a bid for connection is, um, he gives an example of a bid for connection. So a husband and a wife are sitting um, in this fake living room and he's reading the newspaper and she says, oh, there's a bird. And he like, mm-hmm, keeps reading his newspaper. She wasn't telling him really, like, there's a bird. She was saying, hey, buddy, I love you. I'm trying to connect with you. Right? Failed. That was a missed bid for connection. Uh, and we do that all the time. It turns out we miss bids for connection all the time in our personal relationships. Well, it turns out we do it in the hospital, too. And that was a great example of a bid for connection. Again, using different language, like, should I give this Lasix? Hey, I'm worried about this patient, come show up. What, to me, what eCart does is allow us to have a shared language. Hey, I'm worried about this patient, that eCart is in the yellow range, can you come check out this patient? Gives us a way to help bridge the gap in communication. So, um, so I will cl I'll sum up and, and start to come to a conclusion on this, to say, to let me go back to the surviving sepsis, screen every patient, every shift, every day, um, and argue again, now the problem with that is that it applies a one-size-fits-all approach to every single patient in the hospital. And we're not one-size-fits-all. Um, here's the, so I, so I told you I would come back to the idea of what about the really low-risk patients. So, so here's the modified early warning score, uh, and here's your risk of adverse event, or, or the, the rate of adverse event against your uh, modified early warning score. So this was a, we published in JAMA Internal Medicine about four years ago. Um, and so 
I told you Muse was pretty good, right? As Muse goes up, your risk of having an adverse event goes up, as you would expect. And it starts to go up around four and it continues to go up so that if you have a Muse of greater than or equal to seven, that's really bad. On the other hand, we wake every patient every night twice for vital signs. We, if your Muse is one, if your Muse is two, if your Muse is seven, you're getting woken up twice every single night for vital signs. Because again, I'm gonna come back to the care that we give in the hospital, it's one size fits all, and it's one size fits all because it's convenient for us. And what I actually mean is it's convenient for nursing, right? So, and I'll go back to like, nurses what they, you know, the, will we'll push our meds at nine, we'll screen for sepsis at eight, we'll, um, we'll do vital signs at, on these sweeps, we'll do labs on these sweeps, right? That's how we practice because that's works well and it works well in the world of in the in the time of florence nightingale that's exactly how florence nightingale and her folks like we did less to patients back then but that's the idea like we do this at these different times but that's not how our patients behave anymore and so you know the way the the way this stuff should be happening is basically what does the patient need right now and when do they need it and so here's what it looks like when we actually integrate it into the ehr um, so here you're in, pretend like you're in Epic. So this is actually what it looks like. You're uh, an Epic screen. You can click on this tab, see this analytics tab over here? Um, that pulls up this web interface. And so now you're in this patient's chart and you can see their e-card score trended over time and you can see what variable is driving and you can click on any of these individual points and see how those, what was driving it at that point. But now here's where actually it gets really cool because the, I will be the first to tell you that an analytics never gonna save anybody's life. Never. I've spent the last decade of my life building analytics and it will never save a human's life. The only thing, it only happens when clinicians get there and do the right thing. And so the whole point of everything I've done for the last decade is to get the right person to the, bed, to the bedside at the right time so that they can intervene. But now we actually have to help them intervene. So now we can pop up a recommended clinical pathway. So they click on this pathway and here's what that pathway looks up. Like in this hospital, they, they build their own pathway <coughs> super easy to do, but basically they say, you know, is the patient average risk, moderate risk, high risk, um, if, it's, if they're actually average risk now, we say, okay, why was it a data entry or fine, you're done. But no, they're moderate risk. They want to notify their charge nurse and they want, um, if it's new, they want the MD notified. And they can actually put in links that will actually automatically page, but uh, they haven't built that yet. Um, and now they screen for sepsis. So now instead of screening every single patient every shift, they screen the moderate and high risk patients. Do you know how much less work that is? Now they screen the patients when they need it, the patients who need it when they need it, as opposed to every single patient, every shift. Um, so now they say screen, are they worried about new or worsening infection or is it a, is it a non-infectious etiology? They can click any of that. Now they can see this red link. This is the sepsis lab panel, so this is nurse driven. They click that button, they get two blood cultures, a CBC and a lactate, all pended right in there and they sign it per protocol, done, boom, out of there. Um, they're asked to come back and reassess the patient later, uh, and so they can enter respiratory rate, they enter their, their <coughs> Glasgow coma score. All of that gets filed to a flow sheet row, and as it files to the flow sheet row, a new e-card score gets calculated. As they're, like again, this is the EHR actually working for you finally, your billion dollar <coughs> investment now actually starting to pay off. So here's where I think we wanna be. I think we need to move away from this one size fits all approach. Uh, we want to be thinking about your high-risk patients. Those are the ones you want to probably activate RRT on. So you have to think about what's the threshold that works in your institution. When do you want to know? In my institution, they want to know eight hours before. I can tell you exactly what e-card score that is. You, you'd have to tell me. Um, in a moderate risk thresh, uh, if it, moderate risk, whatever it is, and, and it, does, it truly doesn't matter what what scoring tool you use. You can do it for a news too. You can figure out what's the, if, you're, if news is the tool you're gonna use and say, okay, well, you can, you can do it at a threshold of six or above. Those patients will be high risk or, or seven. What's the moderate risk threshold? Um, the average risk threshold, those are the ones that are gonna be routine care. And so I think ultimately we're gonna get to this, a new approach. Again, instead of going in who's infected first and then think about who's sick, which is gonna waste a ton of effort, let's do it the other way. Let's think about who's sick first, 
And then if they're sick, let's think about why they're sick. Because they might be infected, but they might actually have something else going on. And that's really important too, because what if they're really sick and it's actually not sepsis? What if it's you know volume overloaded or hemorrhage or um, um, an aspiration event that isn't infectious? All of those are things that we're going to need to deal with. So here's my basic summary. Uh, SIRS is sensitive, but it's not specific. If you rely on it, you're going to end up with a lot of false alarms. QSOF is specific, but not sensitive. And so if you, if you rely solely on QSOF, you're going to miss a bunch or end up with delayed diagnosis. In general, your early warning scores are better. So MUSE and NEWS are more efficient than either SIRS or QSOFA. But ultimately, machine learning or early warning scores are even better. And really, I think the future is automated big data predictive analytics. That's it. Oh, and respond to your partner's bids for connection. Because <laughs> they love you. <coughs> I'll, and I'm happy to take questions if anyone has any. Yes. How would you respond to the following? Because what you said last was intriguing to me. That, that the now, part about responding to bids for connection. It's not going well at home for me right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but about the sepsis, and, and, and we've got this pendulum where sepsis was killing everybody, and yeah. now we're all over it, and we're doing better with better mortality outcomes. But the problem is that you know, we're defining sepsis in a very different way than we did traditionally, yep. and we're casting a broader net. And what it seems is that, what concerns me is that we pull the sepsis lever, and all of a sudden everybody stops thinking, and it's sepsis, sepsis, sepsis. And thinking horses when you're here, hooves is great. Yeah. Until the zebra kills you. Correct. And so, how, as a content matter expert, how would you respond to avoiding that problem? That that we are in a very algorithmic driven society or medical society now. APPs and dots are all kind of algorithm, algorithm. But that becomes problematic, especially since we've really broadened our sepsis definition and and how we define it. And all of a sudden now, everybody's got sepsis, but. Really not everybody. Correct. I think that's right. I mean, I think that's the classic, we have a hammer, and so everything looks like a nail to us right now. And that that's true. And, and it's because, like I said, sepsis is one of the few things we know how to treat. We actually don't know how to treat so much of the other stuff. So we're like, OK, let's hope it's sepsis. It's what I say in cardiac arrest. I mean, I always train the teams as they're going, like, you should be running the code thinking, I hope it's VF, I hope it's VF, I hope it's VF. Because I can do something about VF, right? The the same thing with sepsis, but and, and I think that's actually the problem of coming at it from the starting with are they infected or not? Because they're like, oh, they're not infected, phew, we're done, walk away. Or, you know, they are infected, but really they weren't infected, it was something else going on. So I think I, I, I think that's the next place, that's, that's where our research is going next. So I, I still think it's what we have, it's the best tool we have, and we know that treating sepsis improves mortality. So I think let's acknowledge that it's not perfect but it's what we have right now and let's and let's do it but let's pay attention to to the other to the other things where my research is going right now we have a big grant from NIH right now to do um, to do a, another predictive analytic that figures out are they infected or not infected because I showed you we're actually that that data about whether whether we suspect infection it turns out we're pretty bad at that question. And in fact, we send a lot of patients to the ICU and we still don't know. We, they discharge, we get, they give them a week of, of, an, of antibiotics and we send them home and in the end they had shock and it was, pro I don't know, it was probably septic and we certainly treated them for it, but we don't, we don't really know. These are cultures never grew anything and we never found anything obvious. Um, and so I, so I don't know. But I will say, so we have this grant now that's doing, that's figuring out what's the probability of you being infected. And, and so the future for me is these analytics will run. And so right now I can tell you, I can order every patient in your hospital from sickest to least sick. Then the next layer that will roll on top of that is now I'll be able to sell you. So this patient has, is, is the sickest. They have a 10% probability of going to the ICU in the next eight hours, but they have a 56% probability of being septic, a 24% probability of being, uh, being hemorrhagic, a 10% probability of being in heart failure, and a 4% probability of having a PE. That's ultimately where we're going to go. So that's the next layer is to help us figure out what's actually going on. It's still only going to be a probability. So you're still going to have to show up and use your clinical judgment and say, yeah, I, I agree with that. That's, um, yeah, I think that's right. This patient is infected. But at least I can help you 
with that. And then the next place is gonna be, okay, well, so as we build those pathways, right now we're building those pathways again with intuition. That three hour bundle, that three hour bundle was built in exactly the same way that SIRS and Muse were. A bunch of really good clinicians sat around the table and said, what should we put in our bundle and when should we ask people to do it? Right? Same thing. The future is actually going to be driving data. Now we'll know. Actually, the bundle really should include these four things, and the timing really should be two hours, 2.4 hours as opposed to three hours. You know, I don't know, but that's where we're going. So um, we're better than we were. All these things. SIRS is better than nothing. Muse is better than that. You know, it, these are, use, use the best tool that you can.